Good morning. We're going to get started here. People can go ahead and kind of find their place and stuff. So I hope everyone is rested up after the Memorial or the Labor Day weekends. I'm Jeff Miller from Radiology, and I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Diana Bardo. Diana came to us about three years ago, I think, from OHSU. Diana did most of her training in the Midwest. She has an undergraduate degree in fine arts, which is not a common but degree, but shows her artistic side um, from Illinois State. Then moved to Chicago, where she went to medical school at Rush. Uh, then did her radiology residency at the Cleveland Clinic, and then returned back to Chicago to complete two fellowships, one in pediatric radiology at the Northwestern System, and then neuroradiology at University of Chicago. Uh, Diana is one of the most brightest, most hardworking people we have in the department. And uh, just to let you know, a lot of this stuff that she's going to show was either the result, direct result of her work or happened because of her leadership. So I think you'll find it very interesting. So Diana. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. I have a um, really sort of a mishmash collection of things about um, new things in our radiology department to talk to you about. If people have questions in the middle of the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand or shout out a question. We can take a break, get through that, or we can do questions at the end as well. Um, so let's get started. In the last year or so, we've had a couple of um, big purchases of equipment upgrades or new equipment. One of those things was um, a 1.5 Tesla magnet. It still looks like the same magnet on the inside, but all the are on the outside, but all the insides are new, new gradients, etc. New way to make images um, called D-stream technology takes that analog image to a digital image right at the magnet instead of send, sending it through the electronic system first. And that allows for increased um, spatial resolution and other, other things, faster image reconstruction. So you may not see it, but hopefully you'll notice images are a little bit better coming off of that magnet. We also have a new CT scanner that arrived when the ED opened. So that's been about a year or so. Um, it's called an icon. When what's really special about that scanner is that it is a spectral CT scanner. It allows us to, through a material decomposition uh, type of image post-processing, figure out what's calcium, what's contrast enhancement versus something else that's also hyperattenuating like blood or uh, protein, things like that. And I'm going to show you some in images of the, from both of those scanners. We can, the um, CT scanner in the ED is only about 100 steps. Well, 130 steps, if I'm, but if I'm feeling really sassy, it's 100 steps from the other C CT scanner. So it's close, and so even inpatients are imaged over there. At the, um, so it's just a very short a ways away. And the 1.5 Tesla magnet is here on the Thomas campus. So this is, these are images from the ICON scanner, and this is a three-year-old little girl, who, or pardon, two-year-old little girl who had uh, pelvic pain. She was imaged outside with an ultrasound. They saw a mass in her pelvis, and she was brought over here. So you can see in the image on the left with the white arrow, there's this low attenuation, sort of complex-looking mass sitting posterior to her urinary bladder. This iodine overlay image, the one that's tinted a little bit green, shows that that doesn't enhance. So enhancing structures like the um, in front here, this is her uterus, that enhances, but the mass back here does not enhance. And on the ultrasound, it looks very complex. Because we're able to tell that it's not enhancing, we can confidently say, even though it was a question whether we had blood flow on the Doppler imaging of her pelvic ultrasound, that this is a non-enhancing mass. This has some characteristics of a torsed ovary, and therefore she was taken to the operating room, detorsed this ovary, and saved the ovary. And this is part of the power of this new CT scanner, is to be able to help us figure these things out a bit more readily. This is a child that had a handlebar injury. This is his normal pancreas, sort of this low attenuation area in the, re in the mid pancreas and the pancreatic tail. It's without, we can take out virtually the contrast enhancement. 
so in a virtual non-contrast from this spectral CT scanner, and then actually decrease the energy level at which we're looking at an in image, and it actually increases the conspicuity of the contrast enhancing structures. So it more clearly and more readily shows us that this is a trans is a transection of his of his pancreas, and we can make those images look with the iodine density image even more conspicuous to help in diagnosis. This is also helpful in brain CT. This is a nine-month-old that had a new onset of a seizure, um, had some swelling on his side of his head, and you can see there's a, on this traditional, this conventional image, you can see that there's a little bit of hyperattenuating tissue here, but it's a bit more conspicuous. Also more conspicuous, notice the gray-white junction between the cortex and the white matter here also more conspicuous, so I'm more confident that there's not a contusion in this brain that I know has a little subdural hemorrhage. And this is a very um, severely injured child in an unrestrained uh, backseat passenger in a motor vehicle collision. Um, here, the conventional brain CT, I kind of wonder if there's blood here. By material decomposition, I can accentuate the conspicuity of that blood here at, in his brain, and then on MRI, when the child becomes more stable, I can confirm the presence of multifocal hemorrhage in his corpus callosum, as we see on the CT, and also throughout the right cerebral hemisphere. Another child in a brain CT, this is CTA, they had had a hemorrhage, you can see all these abnormal vessels along the, genu uh, the splenium of the corpus callosum. There's a little bit of blood here. Is that just blood, you know, extravasating into the thalamus, or what exactly is that? And here we can see that it actually is a small aneurysm in this vascular malformation. One of the new research projects that Dr. Southard, who's the head of our CT area, is working on with urology is detection and identification of the, con of the makeup, the composition of renal stones, renal calculi. So here is a child with a non-contrast CT scan. You can see the stone in the, um, around the UVJ, and here a little bit magnified image. We've taken the uric acid out of this image, so it's bl these little black pixels where uric acid is. So we know that it's partially calcium and partially uric acid. It helps the urologist figure out how to treat the patient um, with dissolving the, uh, the uric acid component of that stone. And something I'm trying to work on now with um, brain maturation, it seems to me that you know, we, can, we can take a newborn and a one-year-old and a two-year-old on um, brain MR, and I can tell you which one is which based on the T1 and the T2 image, image um, intensities of, of the T1 and the T2 signal. I think we might be able to, or at least we'd like to try to figure that out. Here we can see the um, caudate head and the thalamus and the cortex. The gray matter structures are a little bit higher attenuation than the than white matter, and it, we are wondering if that energy separation at C, um, CT can help us figure out if we can make a good estimate of age and maturity and maturation of white matter with CT rather than MRI. Another area that's fairly recently being developed in our MR uh, department is looking at liver stiffness and elastography of the liver. So you can tell this child's abdomen here is a little bit flat. That's there's a, a paddle that's put on the abdomen, and it's sort of like jumping on a trampoline. You're putting, you're compressing the, the liver and seeing how elastic it is with MRI, and looking at what an elastogram here. You can see this very nicely coordinated red, blue, red, blue uh, lines through the elastogram. But the next slide, I'll show you that in a cine sequence, and you can get a better idea how that looks when in a normal liver. We're looking at fat content here, this lesion that looked benign in every, situ in every situation, but enhanced a little bit. 
Um, and here, by taking the fat measurement of this, we can I clearly identify it's a fat benign lesion rather than something that needs to be biopsied. So this is an elastogram. You can see this nice coordination of the red and blue stripes. It's just an indication to us that this liver is nice and supple and elastic and a normal liver. It's important in patients that have um, iron deposition in their liver, Fontan patients, so, so complex congenital heart disease with single ventricle physiology, and eventually these patients end up with a stiff cirrhotic liver. So it's important to measure to be able to measure how elastic that liver is. Now here's somebody. This is a Fontan patient. You can see their Fontan circuit here on CT. It joins the IVC and the SVC in, into the branch pulmonary arteries. Their liver looks a little heterogeneous on MR, and this is their elastogram. Where the red and the right and the blue stripes are very dis discoordinated looking. They just don't line up nicely. This is a very stiff liver, and so, so very abnormal. So being able to detect those things in, in patients, cancer patients that might be iron overloaded, um, they re that are survivors, patients with congenital heart disease. We can reliably identify, identify a point even before they're symptomatic when the liver stiffness becomes abnormal and treat them more and allow you to treat them um, better in a more um, a method that would be better for them. Other things in MRI, we're using uh, different sequences that are allowing us to scan faster. Then in case sequence, this is, a this is the traditional um, MR image of a uh, ankle. And you can see here, the, this is the encase image. So encase allows us to image with one sequence to get axial, sagittal, and coronal, and even off-plane oblique images. And you can see there's a little bit smoother appearance of the bone, of the bone trabeculae, than it is in a standard conventional image. But from this image, which takes a short amount of time, I can get a sagittal and an axial and an off-plane oblique image instead of having to perform three separate sequences. Hopefully this will be easier for a child to lay still and not be sedated or under general anesthesia during MRI, and that actually is better for the patient as well. So this is the types of things we're trying to work on. We started doing some whole body MR. There's quite a few indications for whole body MR. This is de a screening exam, really. But for patients with lymphoma, we can look for lymph nodes, solid tumors, just to identify where they are um, in a patient that's a little bit confusing clinically, screening of ch children with cancer predisposition uh, syndromes, and CRMO, or chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, is a screening exam to help us maybe focus where a, a more specific, specific exam might be required. Um, patients with benign tumor burden, such as um, type 1 neurofibromatosis, osteonecrosis, and intensive, after intensive chemotherapy, and others, uh, musculoskeletal th uh, indications, dermatomyositis, disseminated, disseminated infections, such as coxy and sister psychosis and in McCune-Albright syndrome. So let me show you a patient. This child had chronic hip pain, came to us for a, a whole body scan recently. If I can get my need to move. And this is his whole body scan. Everything looks pretty normal except for this area in his pelvis. On DWI, we could be able to see this is an inverted image, so it looks more like a PET scan. Um, and so you can see the abnormal pelvic mass here. Subsequently, he had a pelvic MR that was dedicated just to the pelvis, therefore higher resolution of those structures, and without and with gadolinium, and found to have a Ewing sarcoma in his pelvis. Whole body MR is also, can also be used with contrast. This is um, to show you some new contra IV contrast that we're utilizing for MR. Ferromoxetol is an iron-based contrast. It's really used 
FDA approved for treatment of um, iron deficiency anemia, but at a lower dose, it actually works very well as, an, uh, as a contrast in him that is something that remains in the blood flow for quite some period of time. In Oregon, when I was there, we were using it as a uh, blood pool contrast that could be imaged as you could see it being taken up by brain tumors and recurrent brain tumor disease. And you can image them at time zero, one day, and even two days later we were imaging patients. So with a small dose, this is a child that has multifocal vascular occlusions and very difficult line placement. And so you can see the very interesting, we get arterial and venous contrast enhancement even out into the lower extremities in this baby, the intercostal um, arteries and veins, very small arteries and veins, and you can see that there's not good enhancement in the left upper extremity, so this would not be an ideal access point to start a new, uh, new line. And then one of the things that we, we've recently, uh, about a year ago, Dr. Uh, Luis Gonsalves came to work with us. He is a maternal fetal medicine and physician and a pediatric radiologist, so an unusual combination. So we're doing some fetal MRI in addition to uh, more, uh, more often now than we, than we used to. Dr. Cornejo from neuroradiology is in charge of the fetal MR and we're moving into cardiac, fetal cardiac MR. So we saw this baby as a fetus and noticed that there's kind of a small right lung and these two vascular structures that were a little bit confusing on the fetal MR. Because there was some congenital heart abnormalities, the patient came here after being born locally instead of in a remote uh, location where her parents lived. And you can see these two vessels. These are scimitar veins. I've never seen a child with two scimitar veins instead of just one until this child. And you can see how they drain down below the um, hemidiaphragm as well. And the heart is malpositioned into the right, hand, right side of the chest, both on the fetal MR where we at the time didn't have very much um, detail in the heart, and then on her postnatal CT scan. But we're getting better at fetal MR. So this is ultrasound and MR, the ultrasound on the top with the white arrow and the red arrow showing us a fetal MR cardiac study that's being done here. We're using an electronic ECG simulator device to get these images. You can see um, moderator band in some of the images here, as well as the papillary muscles, the four chambers of the heart. This is a three vessel view, both in ultrasound and on MRI, where you can see the pulmonary, main pulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary arteries, the ascending aorta, SVC, and a trachea, three vessel tracheal view which is a common uh, fetal ultrasound view that you can actually see these structures on MRI. This was a 28-week uh, fetus. And these are different fetuses at different ages as well. The ductal arch, both on ultrasound and CT, and the aor aortic arch. Can be helpful in bone dysplasia and other findings as well in this child with a severe scoliosis in utero on ultrasound, a 3D reconstruction of the ultrasound images here, showing that severe scoliosis and vertebral bodies that are malformed. And we've recently also upgraded all of the ultrasound machines in uh, the Tom on the Thomas campus. The ones, the ultrasound machines that were on t at the Thomas campus have been sent out to the uh, satellite clinics. So the, there's really an upgrade in what was being performed out there as well. And very excellent, this is a, a testis in a little guy with testis pain that had a question of whether there was really blood flow or was there torsion here. With micro imaging, microvascular imaging, we can actually see that there's a blood vessel and blood flow here. So an increased conspicuity of the blood flow at a, at, even at slower rates. This is another child with an advanced testis torsion. You can see the destruction of the testis in the ischemic regions here forming in the vessels not looking normal. Because of the new linear probes, et cetera, in ultrasound, we have a better way of, or a better look at neonatal brain imaging as well. Here the corpus callosum, 
is really quite well defined. It's better than we've seen in in our previous um, iteration of ultrasound machines. Even looking here at the uncus and the amygdala, those structures are more readily visualized and better to have ultrasound done at the bedside than maybe bringing the child to CT or MR for studies. 3D ultrasound reconstruction is actually with cystic structures like a gallbladder. Um, it can be very helpful in diagnosis. This is a child with a duplicated gallbladder. We couldn't figure this out. It was a little bit difficult to understand what was going on in a 2D mode because you don't often run across somebody with two gallbladders. And so the 3D with put this in motion and, and spin it around helps you look at things better. We're using co contrast for ultrasound as well. Intravenous contrast can be delivered during ultrasound. This is a child with a normal kidney. You can see, the, as you might expect, everything except the uh, collecting system um, enhancing here with the contrast. And uh, here a child with an otherwise normal kidney, but a little, tiny little area that does not enhance, and this is a renal cyst. And in a patient with liver ultrasound, the liver looks very bland, very benign here, but actually you can see that there actually is something unusual about the liver here, something you totally would have missed with, uh, without the contrast, but now you're seeing this focal nodular hypoplasia in the liver. And in, back to um, the microflow imaging, looking at a tumor in this kidney. You can see the tumor here, but understanding the blood flow can be very helpful to the surgeon. Do we need to, um, if we're considering resecting this, do we need to embolize this first? Here we can see on microflow imaging that there's really quite low blood flow to that mass, and so would be a safe resection without pretreatment. And maybe this might be helpful in looking at um, the appendix in appendicitis in this patient, just looking at the, mic at the dilated, thick-walled appendix. Here the microflow shows that there's increased um, blood flow to that appendix, also to some of the mesenteric fat surrounding it, so lots of hyperemia, and probably help us confirm that this truly is appendicitis if there is a question. It's something, an area of potential uh, research for us here. And we're doing uh, many more ultrasound examinations for mid-gut volvulus and malrotation, noting where the um, superior mesenteric artery and vein and their relationship are. Here you can see a child, this is on the right, in the, the left and the right-hand sides of the screen. This is the same child. You can see these vessels encircling um, the area of vo the volvulus here in the mid-gut. And when in a normal child, that, that SMA-SMB relationship doesn't do that. Magic rods is something that the um, ortho, um, orthopedic surgeons are looking at. They're adjustable um, spinal rods for scoliosis. Children come in, have an ultrasound to look at where the, what the um, length of those spinal rods are. An adjustment to those rods can be made to help the child, help the um, child maintain or increase, decrease their scoliosis. Um, at intermittent uh, times, and we can make those measurements on ultrasound. And one of our former fellows, uh, Dean uh, Van Tassel and then Dr. Barnes in musculoskeletal radiology are looking, at, along with the surgeons, looking at um, dynamic ultrasound for slipping rib syndrome. So you can see a rib here and rib here. And this is the maneuver that is performed on the patient with the ultrasound probe here and the physician pressing on the ribs. Normally the ribs should remain separate. And on this, you can see in this child, which it starts again, rib here and rib here, this rib becomes hooked underneath the upper rib. So this is a slipping rib, can be very painful for the child. And so diagnostically, the ultrasound is very helpful. I understand this is a very, sort of a difficult diagnosis to make clinically to know for certain. And so visualizing what's happening underneath the skin with ultrasound is very helpful. 
We have a 3D innovation lab uh, with two very talented technologists that um, work on reconstructing images. It's, it's be especially helpful in vascular imaging studies, but it be more and more is becoming um, very crucial to helping us in diagnosis of musculoskeletal exams as well. Here a child with a patella, but there's two little bone fragments sitting here that are, you can see on the 3D reconstructed image as well. Here the cartilage has been covered, colored green and the bone fragments here that it can be seen, can help visualize for the surgeon and also for the patient, for the patient's family so that you can help them understand why a procedure might need to be done or might not need to be done. This is a child that had a, a painful elbow, couldn't straighten her elbow for two or three weeks after a fall. The radiographs were, were very benign looking, but that was because she did not have ossification in her epicondyle. You can see here that once the MR is done, here's the, the chondroid mass of that ossification center, not yet ossified. As the bone started healing, we got a little bit of ossification in that, but we can see completely displaced uh, condyle here. So the 3D lab is very helpful in helping us make these uh, diagnoses or at least to understand the anatomy. So computational flow dynamics is something that I've been interested in for quite some time on the cardiac, um, in cardiac imaging. Particularly in adults with congenital heart disease, we've been doing some rest and stress um, cardiac CT. And here, in this, this is a patient that has a detransposition, so his aorta and his pulmonary artery were coming off the wrong ventricles when he was born. They were switched from right to left and left to right and his coronary arteries were reimplanted. In that procedure, the pulmonary arteries in a LeCompte maneuver were draped over top of the aorta. And this is the pulmonary artery. This is the left main coronary. The calcification is just a little suture, but not atherosclerotic disease. And you can see that there's some narrowing that happens as his heart beats. There is some narrowing that happens at that coronary origin. And this guy had chest pain. In fact, when I stressed him with regadenozone at the, on the scanner, he had ST elevation. So he was having ischemia during stress. And you can see the angle sort of changes at end systole and end diastole here. And using computational flow dynamics, um, we can estimate the fractional flow reserve. We can estimate how much flow and what the pressure is in, the, in an artery during systole and during end diastole. Here at end systole, it looks pretty normal. The blue color is a, is a good indication that we have normal flow without being able to even read the numbers here. However, in end diastole, when you're supposed to be having more flow to the myocardium through your coronary arteries, he has diminished flow in that left main coronary. This is the reason for his stress, uh, his ischemia during stress and his chest pain at rest. So he, he needs a cabbage. He needs a coronary artery bypass graft to assist in blood flow to his myocardium. Probably this is very interesting and I haven't figured it out yet because not many people are doing congenital heart disease um, computational flow dynamics. These are two separate, two different patients, an infant here and a 14-year-old here with coarctation of the aorta. This kid has lived all his life 14 years with his coarctation being undiscovered until the time of this CT scan. And you can see blue, blue is a good flow all the way, and both, of the, both children have good flow in their ascending aorta and their brachiocephalic arteries to their head and neck. But the aorta flow distally is abnormal. So here, very tight stenosis, also very tight stenosis here. This baby has not lived long enough even in utero and for the first few days of life to have collateral form that were visible, readily visible on CT, but this 14-year-old has. So you can see collaterals coming from the intercostals, from head and neck vessel, uh, drainage, et cetera, into that distal ascend descending aorta. Um, we're seeing some flow reversal in the um, aorta in these patients as well. Just working on the research end of this, trying to get this to be something that we think is, is 
publishable and meaningful. And I think this is toward the end here, lastly, we're, doing, we're looking at how we're measuring tumors. You know, every radiologist in our reading room thinks we're measuring tumor the right way. Every radiologist in the world thinks you're measuring tumors the right way. But if you line up 100 of them and give them, we've lined up 11 here, give them 100 tumors to measure, there, the variation in tumor measurement is dramatic, actually. So linear measurement is probably antiquated at this point. So what we're trying to do in our 3D lab is also to look at tumor volumes. So just for an example, tumor A here is a very spherical looking tumor, and tumor B here is a funny looking shape. And if you look at the variation between 11 radiologists, and then I've had three technologists measure them as well using a volumetric method instead of linear measurements, when it's a very smooth tumor, everybody's pretty close in what their measurements are. And out of our 100 tumors, we had 19 of them that were, we thought were smooth. And so you can see how nice the curves flow together. Everybody's measurements are very similar. However, when you look at tumors that are very irregular, you can see that they're kind of all over the place. So our gold standard here was the volumetric measurements. And the linear measurements vary by even up to a liter in some of these tumors. So that makes a huge difference. It might influence how you treat a patient. It might influence whether you stop chemotherapy or go to a more aggressive chemotherapy, et cetera. So we're working on trying to prove that tumor volumetrics is much more reliable than linear measurements. And that's all I have. If you have questions, please. Yes. They don't. That's the good news, is they don't. It's all part of our normal examination. It all, it all happens in real time. Yes. You know, not at this point. And so I think it would be an, an interesting um, research application to, you know, see if we can, if we should, because we could, there's no reason we couldn't, um, but it's not something that's part of our routine protocol at this point. And so, you know, you would be an ideal person to work with in doing that. It's not. It's not. And in fact, that's really one of the indications that uh, the ferromoxetol, or it's also called ferrahim, the uh, commercial name, is not renal toxic. And so it actually is indicated um, in patients, say, with uh, renal artery stenosis that you're wondering about and, they're, and they have poor renal function. It's one of the reasons um, other institutions have started using that contrast. Now, I will say for ferrahim and ferromoxetol, we've done two cases, so it's, it's a pretty new drug here. Um, it has um, sort of a bad reputation as far as contrast uh, formulations go because when it is given fast and when it is given at high doses, such as when it's used for um, iron deficiency anemia, it has had a couple, has had some anaphylactic reactions. However, um, there's excellent safety profile in giving it um, at lower, much lower doses as we do for MRI. Um, the infusion now is recommended to go over 15 minutes, uh, which is what we're doing. And so that anaphylactic reaction uh, risk is very, very, very low on the order of the similar as iodinated contrast for CT and gadolinium for MR. Because of, because of that, and it's a new drug here, we're taking it slow. So we are only doing those kinds of cases during the daytime, during the weekday, weekday hours. 
Yes. Yes, we're, we're um, calculating fat fractions in those patients to help us, um, first of all, place them, the patient in the right category, and secondly, to monitor any um, therapy that is performed to um, lower their fat content, et cetera. Yes. So the average time for a whole body MR, we're doing um, a T2 fat sat and non-fat sat and a, uh, what's called DWIBS or a, GW, a diffusion weighted sequence. It's about 40 minutes because there's, depending on the height of the child, um, you know, if it's a teenager that's six feet tall, it's going to take longer. If it's an infant that's two feet tall, it's not going to take all that long. Um, but about 40 minutes for your average size um, child. and um, no, and case is not used in that, um, just because of some of the physics of the image acquisition. In cases, actually, it seems like it's much more helpful um, for small joints, um, and like the ankle that I showed you, or maybe for a hand, uh, etc., because it can decrease some of those because of the physics of the image acquisition can d decrease some of those imaging times. And then those are the kinds of things you really want a 3D reconstruction in. You want to be able to rotate it to be able to see a, one single joint better because, you know, if you put your hand down, your thumb is at a different angle, sagittal of your thumb is at a different angle of sagittal of the rest of your hand, or that kind of thing. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <laughs>